well, oh well, oh well, oh well. Join me, because I can't hit all the notes. Well, oh 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 well, yes, all is well. Bum. Yeah. Hi, Stan. Ah, shoot. My AC just turned on. <laughs> oh, your AC just turned on. on. My AC is not on. Okay, now it's off. How's the temperature there? Today, it's, it's fine. It's, cool. it's, it's fine. Like, okay. It's currently 80. Very comfortable. Well, that's good. Temperature. It's cooler down where you are. Now, yesterday, it was pretty hot, right? Yeah, it was pretty hot yesterday, yeah. but I was inside in my AC. I see. <laughs> and people come to this podcast because they want to know how the weather is in Southern California. Yes. Yeah, they want to know if we're comfortable. Well, we've we've certainly... Well, I guess we're done. We've done yeah, we've done our first part. Yeah. What's next? Uh, we should probably also help them in some way or entertain them. I'll work on the helping part. You work on the entertaining part. All right. Should I just <laughs> just drive up the energy and be obnoxious? Is that how you entertain people? Energy going up does not necessarily mean that it's obnoxious, right? Yeah, but I could do both. We can work on both and work on them yeah. one at a time because we should separate disciplines. That's a, a thing. Mm. The Dionysian and the Apollonian ways of training artists and the being obnoxious part is the Dionysian. What does Dionysian mean? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Well, I'm curious now. What's Dionysian? Where does that come from? That Oh, well, that's Greek. Do you, are you not familiar with that? Is that like somebody's name, like Dionysus or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to take a minute? <laughs> is it related to art or is it all just philosophy? I mean, I guess that's an art, but... Stan, I divide up all art training yeah? into the Dionysian and Apollonian uh, ap approaches. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing this. Dionysus is the god of wine, and we're talking about revelry and fertility and uh, capable of anything, untamed fights against authority. Okay. Uh, not a god that you want to adopt as your own, as the only god, because it's a hard god. Dionysus is a hard god for the hangover. Uh, and then uh, Apollo is the, the mentor that guides you through the stages of your life and is a skilled hunter, much more rational. Okay. And either one, if you, if you, that's a hard God to submit to in the early stages because Apollo demands accountability, but it is the two together that make the interesting combination to have the wildness that makes life worth living mm -hmm. and the skill that makes that wildness channel into form. So is that kind of like the the skilled craftsman versus the creative freedom of experimentation and stuff? It is exactly that. Okay, cool. And even scientists get divided up in this way because there are some scientists who want to break new ground, uh, new innovations, yeah. uh, just get this thing through. And there are the other ones who will carry things out according to the proper procedures. So you can divide a lot of things into there, but I feel like uh, with art education, you've got your creative training, which is to not follow the rules, but to do the crazy stuff that could yield anything, but in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Apollonian is perspective and anatomy and uh, the hard stuff. Yeah. What artists call the hard stuff. Nice. How'd we do? You did great. Now I, now I know. Apollonian and Di Dionysian. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've, I've stereotyped them. They're more complex than what I've said, uh. but as an understanding of two opposite types. You can just read their, read their uh, uh, Wikipedia entries, since Wikipedia is the source of all human knowledge. Not all. You can read subtext in the Wikipedia uh, entries. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Look up that art school you're going to and notice how they will use terms like in the beautiful balmy climate of. <laughs> <laughs> that, that did not come from a uh, from an objective outside source. <laughs> Which school are you talking about? Sounds like a California school. <laughs> sure, that's how I would advertise my school on Wikipedia. Yeah. In the beautiful, balmy, occasionally hot, but 
Air conditioning exists. Yeah. Look up their Wikipedia entries and you'll get enough about them. Cool. Okay. Okay, what do we do today? We're, oh, we're going to do voicemails. We got, we got more voicemails coming in and we, uh, we appreciate you, so we will answer your questions. <laughs> okay, let's have it. Let, let me play the first one. Okay, I'm ready. Hi, my name is Scott. I'm an undergraduate student um, and I'm trying to figure out what kind of secondary education I should pursue. I know Stan has a background in Atelier training at Watts. And I'm not 100% sure about Marshall's education, but I know that he's an instructor. And I'm just curious if you guys could kind of define and elaborate the difference between graduate school and an atelier school, pros and cons, and kind of see what direction either one would point an artist in. Thank you. I think we've touched on this quite a bit. It's basically, it depends a lot on the, the individual school. And the individual person, what they're seeking. The person seeking and the specific teacher in the school you're studying with at that moment. You're going to have schools that are generally very good, like graduate schools that are really good and some that are really bad. You're going to have ateliers that are really good and some that are really bad. Um, personally, I prefer, generally, I prefer the atelier system where you have more control um of your what you're taking the classes you could choose who you know which instructors you want to study with uh you're not doing it for some degree and it's also usually quite a bit cheaper you, you know you're, you're getting uh the same or sometimes better information uh for a much lower cost because it's a more more of a private smaller shop um and you typically these ateliers are usually small, which means that you're going to get to know your instructors better. They're going to get to know you better um, than if you're in a larger college that you kind of go through a system and there's thousands of students. And so I, I really uh, valued the community aspect of going to a school. And so I think that's an, the, a smaller size school to me would be very important. And so I would... I would think about that aspect of it. Yeah. You have to look at like, are you limited by what city you're going to be going to school in? If you're limited to a specific city, well, then you got to look at the ateliers in that city and the, you know, the colleges in that city and compare. The colleges in the city that you're going in might be better. Who knows? Um, depends on the, what the best teachers in that city decide to do. Maybe... In some, you know, some college has really good benefits for teachers and, and the best ones decide to teach there. I don't know. It, it, it's, you have to analyze each one, but yeah, the, the size is really, I think, the size and the cost, I think, are the biggest difference uh, to consider, right? What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we've said so much about this that I have nothing new to say except that I can't answer the question because you didn't say the thing that I think is most important, which is why. Why what? Why are you going to school? What is it you're seeking? What do you hope to get? And then when you research schools, you look at any school long enough, if they've got good PR, they will convince you uh, because they're going to tell you their best things. But you've got to start with the more important thing, which is what are you seeking? And then you have a criteria to ask whether this is worth it. That's a good point. I feel like most students don't even think about that. What are you seeking? Uh, obviously. You think about or you just decide, I want to become an artist. And so, the natural step is, I'm going to go to school. And that's the end of the analysis <laughs> of, of that. Yeah. You just say, that's the next step. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to listen to our uh, Recreating Art School series. It's the the first eight or so episodes in season two of Draftsman. So, listen to all of that and you'll get a much better idea of what school is, what you get out of it, what parts yeah. you can recreate on your own, what parts you should go to school for. Uh, go listen to that. Yeah. I think the same thing. Anyway, next next question. Hi, I'm in you from Georgia and I'm asking this question on behalf of my friend in Brazil. Uh, our question is, what are the biggest and or most common misconceptions that people give to beginner artists, as in terrible art advice. <laughs> oh, terrible <Thanks>. art advice. <laughs> and I said, as in terrible artists. Uh, yeah, beginners, right. as terrible. in terrible <laughs> artists. No, so, terrible advice. 
Uh, mm -hmm. To beginners. I don't want to say any specific advice that is terrible because any advice that is maybe tailored to an individual, like if you have a private mentor, might be good advice. Depends on if that's the advice you need. Um, but generally, I would say bad advice is anything that's too specific, that's too subjective, that is leading you down a very specific path that you don't necessarily choose to go down. It's just like an, a, a, an opinion of the instructor. Like the instructor doesn't like abstract art, so they tell you, ah, don't study abstract art, it's useless. Like that's way too specific. Why? Why not study abstract art? Uh, and then also just any advice that people say never do something or always do this, typically you need to ask why. Um, and then usually you'll see that that's, there's specific cases where you never do it and specific cases where you <laughs> always do it. And then there's cases where you can do it. And so yeah. asking the why will get, will make you more informed about when to not and to do that thing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that anything, any advice could be good advice and bad advice depending on the situation and the person. So Yeah. I would have liked this question better if you were to give me a specific bit of advice that someone gave you that brought up the question. Yeah. Because if, if you want us to brainstorm for a while on all the different kinds of bad advice people can give beginners, uh, I think that we have touched on so many of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Bad advice is go into the arts and go into debt to get your training. That's bad <laughs> advice. Yeah. But sometimes that could be good advice, you it know? It sure could. So, that's, that, that, that's it. But that's one of those ones that 98% of the time exactly. you're confident to say that that's not good advice. Hey guys, I'm Sean. I'm a painter. Uh, I've been looking into getting prints made of my paintings and it's been an ordeal. I can't find a scanner that'll do larger than like 8.5 by 11 at any reasonable price. Even if I did, I don't know what the quality of image I would get out of that would be. I've been looking at using a DSLR to photograph the paintings, but it's been a uh, huge pain getting the camera and the painting playing exactly parallel and accounting for ambient light and glare on the painting. And I hadn't even gotten to the point of actually looking at pricing out getting the prints made. So, yeah, any advice on best method, methods for uh, getting the images for printing and then how to get the prints made would be awesome. Thank you. So have you ever made prints of your stuff? Uh, not to speak of some, and the, not speak. Okay. The quality of prints now is so great. I, you know, there's companies in Orange County that really tout their yeah. their wares and do great work. Yeah. The scanning thing, I know quite a bit about. I know that there's very very expensive scanners that the Giclée companies use to scan the paintings in a way that looks like it's it's well lit. Yeah. Get the right colors and all, and then like super high resolution, all that stuff, but. You, know, you won't be able to do that at home. You, if, you, if you're really selling your stuff for a lot of money, you can start, make, you know, putting in money into making these really high quality glaze of your stuff. If you're talking about prints that you're going to be selling for, you know, 15, 20 bucks at conventions, you're probably not going to be scanning your stuff mm -hmm. like this. Probably. Unless you're selling like thousands and thousands of these prints, I'm assuming, right? But you could get really good photographs of your art now because cameras are also really good mm -hmm. um and also by the way i just have you heard of lightroom's new enhance feature no tell me about lightroom's new enhance feature oh my god <laughs> so you know like in the movies in the 90s there's like a detective movie or a detective yeah detective movie and they're like they're trying to solve a, a crime scene and, and, and there's a, they have a really crappy camera recording of something happening and they're like, zoom in. Yeah. In, yeah. Enha enhance. Can you enhance it? Can you enhance it? Can we enhance this? Can you enhance it? Hold on a second, I'll enhance. Zoom in on the door. Times 10. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so a license plate that was a total blur Just, comes into Chris. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. So that kind of exists now. Not really. Not, not to the extent that the movies did it. Uh, but. It kind of does exist. But it's smart though. It's smart at figuring it out. Yes. It doesn't just like make it sharper. It's not a calculator. It actually uses AI right. to invent cor really correctly, I think. I, like, I've done some tests. I did some tests yesterday. I took a picture of the uh, painting I did of Christian. Remember I was talking about how I was trying yeah, to copy Fetchin? Fetchin, yeah. I took a picture of it and then I realized, oh man, 
my black magic pocket cinema camera doesn't actually take pictures it just takes a still of the 4k resolution which is actually not that high of a resolution right yeah not compared to a still camera right for video that's that's amazing but for a photo camera that's actually pretty low mm -hmm. and i was like oh man but this camera gets the best color yeah it's the most accurate in, in as far as color goes and then i remembered about lightroom's enhanced feature i'm like well let's see Let's see if I could just get the best color in a 4K and then blow it up to 2X and get really high resolution. And it, it was amazing. <laughs> really? Really? It is so good. It is so good. I'm surprised. I cannot believe it works this well. Wow. I don't have anything to say bad about it. Okay. Well, that's, that's a big recommendation. It is perfect. If you take a photo that's not blurry, yeah. if it's a little bit blurry, it'll keep the blurriness. It's not going to like unblur it. It's just going to add resolution to it. It's amazing. So if you have a lower resolution, well-lit, uh, sharp photo right. and you enhance it, you'll now have a higher resolution image that is still well-lit, still good color, you know, still all, the, all that stuff, but now it's bigger. I did it twice. So, so <laughs> You were testing it? Yeah, I was testing it. So what I did is I enhanced it and now I'm at 8K. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, what if I enhance it again? It wouldn't let me. It wouldn't let me. So I just saved the JPEG. I kind of exported the JPEG, brought that back in a Lightroom as like a fresh JPEG without the metadata that it was already enhanced. Uh -huh. And then I ran it again and it did it again. And now I had a 16K image. And when I zoom in, like the brush strokes are perfect. It's, it it, it wow. does such a great job of, of inventing these brush strokes. <laughs> well, Stan, your, your critical eye and your enthusiasm combined together yeah. are, are making me excited about about it. Honestly, if I had the choice of using a camera with worse quality color, mm -hmm. but had large resolution, or this option where I'm, it's really accurate color, and it's raw, it's still a raw, yeah, it's still raw because Black Magic does raw video, okay, and so it'll take a raw still as well, and and then enhance it. I would prefer that option because really, the, yes, be, because the color accuracy matters so much. Yes. Well, let me tell you why I would be the opposite. Okay. Is that when I bought my first scanner, it was an Agfa. It was a really good scanner, really expensive too, and it was the slowest scanner on the market. But the reason I bought it was because it was the best consumer scanner on the market. And what was important to me is that if you scan something at six hundred or twelve hundred optical DPI, that is very important. It is not interpolated. It's tr truly seeing it at at a high density. Then you get the texture of the paper truly as the texture of the paper was. Now here's now here's why that's important to me more than color accuracy. Although this one was really color accurate, is that you have such leeway over color adjustment just in Photoshop alone, with isolating hues and spectra of of saturations and moving them any way you want. That you I know that you can fix color, but if you're going to enhance. Uh texture, hang on, if you're uh, going to enhance texture, you are, even with AI, interpolating. In other words, if I dig in with a pen and it's got a grit and a shellackiness of that dried ink, I can always get a low resolution uh, scan of it and then put a filter on it or use AI to heighten the texture, but it is still not the true texture of what that ink on that paper was. I know what you're saying. But 4K is not a low resolution. Okay, okay. In, in, in other words, it has enough information. It has enough information about every single brush stroke, about every hair. Yeah. It is, it is pixelated. Yeah. You could totally see, see the pixels along every, every hair of every brush stroke, but you could still see that it's there. Yeah, I understand. When it processes it, it's like, oh no, that, that's, like, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's not inventing a brush stroke the way I think brush strokes are. It's using that brush stroke. And so 4K is totally enough. If I'm going from like 480p. It would be harder. Yeah, of course. None of the textures there. It, it probably will just think it's a smooth surface. Won't even add any texture to it at all. But with this specific situation, it got way more than enough. And then going to, you know, 4X, 2X, 2 times 4X <laughs> is, uh -huh. is very good. 
Yeah. It would it would be worse for me to try to get the colors correct. If it's a drawing, it's a totally different issue. But with oil paintings, it is very, very difficult if you got a bad camera to fix the colors in post. It, there's too much. You, I'm, I'd spend an hour just trying to like, ah, man, but now this is off over here. Oh, no, shift the blues. Ah, but it throws this off. It's like I'm repainting the whole thing. That makes sense. Yeah. But, and I think what I'm getting, I, I, don't, I, I do not want to in any way dampen enthusiasm for this new technology because what I'm gathering is that you've got enough resolution in 4K to where if somebody's eyelashes are distributed yeah. a little differently than someone else's and it can't see every individual eyelash, it's smart enough to know that that cluster and that cluster would look like this. So it's really using intelligence to upsample. Right. Which... Of course, just pure interpolated upsampling is not using intelligence. Right. Not in the same way. Okay, I got it. You have a, a really good point, though. This is something you need to consider because, for example, I took a photo of an 11 by 14 painting. Mm -hmm. And so 4K for an 11 by 14 is plenty of pixels for every bump on the canvas. I, yeah. we, they could, we could see the bump. We could see the textures created of the paint on each bump. We could see the brush strokes. But if I'm taking a picture of a you know, six foot painting, I'm not going to back up and take a 4K photo of that painting because that that is totally not enough Yeah, to get it. I would probably take pictures in sections. Okay. Merge them together. And Photoshop has great merging feature where it's perfect. You won't be able to tell. You, you've probably used it. I mean, this has been around for like 10 years. I have. And then do the whole upscaling from there. Um, in fact, I do that all the time. If it's a painting that's bigger than like a eight, uh, 18 by 24 or sometimes even 18 by 24, I'll take, I'll, if it's like a vertical 18 by 24, I'll take a horizontal picture of the top half and a horizontal picture of the bottom half and I'll slice them together and now I can upscale as well. I know. And it's beautiful. But that wasn't even his question. I just used this as an opportunity. To show my excitement about <laughs> because he's what he's really asking here is how do I light it? It's a hassle. What do I do to make these prints? Yeah. He he specifically talked about glare. I've experimented a lot with this and I've done a lot of research. And I can tell you the only way, the only true, truly professional way to take photos of oil paintings or anything that has ref that can reflect, like even graphite. Uh, graphite portraits, you're going to have to do the same process with graphite portraits, is to get a camera where you can put a polarizing filter on the lens, buy polarizing sheets that you're going to put over your light sources, make sure that your light sources are pointing 45 degrees into the surface of the art. Both of them from the same axis. Both yeah. of them, probably at the level of the painting. So, if your painting is here, make sure they're at the same height pointing 45 degrees, mm -hmm. cameras in the middle, pointing right at it. Um, and then you twist that polarizing filter on the camera to get the right amount of reflection. Don't remove all reflection because sometimes that is, you need that to show a little bit of texture. Yeah, the shininess. That a little bit, just a little bit. But sometimes the shininess just destroys the values completely. It's like you got a dark stroke in there. That's right. With all the glare, it just looks like a bright highlight. Yeah. Uh, the whole background all of a sudden looks like a, you know, three or four values lighter than, than it was meant to be. So, you pick the right amount of reflection and you take a picture. You can even do, do a few options, take pictures and then analyze them later. I, I know that this sounds like a lot of work. And initially, when you're, you're learning how to set it all up correctly, it is a lot of work. Because you have to buy the sheets, you have to experiment with the angles. But after that, it's not that bad. It'll take you 10 minutes to set up for a photo shoot of a painting. That's not horrible. I mean, if you're going to be making prints of, of this stuff, you should spend 10, 10 minutes to set it up so that you get a good photo of it. Yeah. Seriously, like, it's really not that bad. But yeah, the learning, the learning curve for it is, is going to take you many hours, many, many hours to figure it out um, and some money to buy polarizing sheets. Yeah. And it's hard to get them. There, there's only a few places online I found that you can buy polarizing sheets. And they're basically these like, uh, gosh, they're, they're like sheets of paper, but they're transparent, obviously. They're very dark. Uh, they're like plasticky. And they're very long. You could buy them by the, by the foot. So, you buy a big enough one to cover your entire light source. 
close all the windows in your room, make sure that the only light sources in your room are these two 45 degree lights. I use light boxes. You could also put it over some LEDs. Uh, just make sure you're getting plenty of light. Um, and that's, that's how you, that's the only professional way to do it. You could also just make sure you get a right angle, the good angle on it, but I've never had good results with thick paint. If the paint is thin, yeah, you, you could, you could get away with just like angling it away from the light source just right. And there's always going to be a brush stroke that's facing the light somehow getting too much, too many reflections. So. Stan, well, that, that all comes from experience. And also, I never knew that on this podcast that we would put that much into some of these technical things, but I am so glad you've <laughs> asked about this because it means that you care about the quality of what goes into your computer before it goes out into the print. Yeah. You're not slovenly about it. You're aware that it isn't looking good enough and it could look better. Audio engineers... Uh, sarcastic remark that will fix it in the mix. It is a sarcastic <laughs> remark. What they yeah. mean is what goes into the microphone is what you have control over in the studio and do not say we'll fix it in the mix. Fix it at the first stage, which is the argument for getting it into your camera, into your scanner well. And yeah. oh, it's a, but it's a whole big topic. We really need, we would need an hour to an hour and a half, maybe even two or three just to touch on all of the things that are involved. Like you said, the difference between a flat drawing where scanning it has got a little laser that's looking at every little dot on there, which is not natural for an oil paint, uh, oil painting, especially if it's impasto. It's not meant to be viewed that way. Right. You need to get the camera back so that you can see how light affects it. But then when you get the camera back and you do it in patches, they don't line up right because there's a little distortion from the position of the lens. But then you put it in Photoshop and they got the merge tools now that will put it together and you go, but th there is a lot to this. And the fact that you care means that your presentations, your scans, the work that you get into the computer will give you less pain later. Yeah, this is a really good question. And I, it's funny because this, this subject was the very, very first lesson the first video I was going to publish on YouTube yeah. that I ended up not publishing because I didn't like how I did it. Yeah, you showed me. Yes, and I ended up scrapping it and did the Loomis method. Yeah. But I still have like all the information written down for a script for that video. I should probably do it. They're, they're, this is very helpful for people. <laughs> I don't know why I still haven't done it. I haven't revisited it. Hey, this is something people could put in the comments though. If you needed, if you wanted an hour or two of instruction on how to get stuff into your computer. I wouldn't need an hour or two. I mean, right now, where do people go to, to learn this? Mm. I learned it really well from a book that Agfa had with their scanner about how to use their scanner. They had someone who was just a great teacher explaining what bit depth was and why RGB and CMYK are different and what happens when it translates one from to another and why one kind of scanner is better than another. It was just a wealth of it. And then there was a book, which I don't have anymore, about how to turn your, your scanner into a, design, a camera and design tool or something like that, that rounded out my education so that in a matter of a year, I knew everything I needed to know about what happens with the artwork once it goes into the computer. Every artist should know stuff like that, mm -hmm. the way they should know digital cameras, yeah, file formats, all that other stuff. But I don't know where to go. Where do, do you know any current? That, that, see, that was back in the 90s, even before we had the internet to help us. Do you know of a current place or is it going to be a Proco thing and we just have to wait for it? I don't know of one place that you could get all of it. I mean, I, when I was doing the research for myself, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I went to like 20 different websites and YouTube videos to kind of piece everything together. Right. I'm sure there's more now because when I did this, this was 10 years ago when I did the research for it. There's probably a lot more now. You could just search for how to photograph a painting, how to scan a drawing, how to, you know, how to get rid of glare on a painting, whatever. You, I'm, I'm sure there's stuff out there, but you just have to piece it together. If our listeners or viewers know of a really good resource, share in the comments. Yeah. By the way, Marshall, can you, do you have any low res scans that you or photos you have of your artwork from like, 
20 years ago that you're like, man, I wish I could take a picture of that from, and you don't have the artwork anymore? I have some actually, since I, since I got rid of, since I wore out my really quality scanner, I just used the scanner on my printer, which is not a good scanner, mm -hmm. but it's good enough. Yeah. So, that's what I would use is something that I've scanned at say 300 DPI and uh, instead of 600 or 1200. Okay, send me some low res that you wish were bigger and I'll, I'll process it. It's super fast. It takes like a second. Okay. And I'll send it to you and you tell me how good you think it is, how accurate. Okay. This is Future Marshall assessing the improvement or damage to my drawings from enhancing them. Here's the king and queen from the second to the last chapter of Alice in Wonderland. It's graphite pencils on Marilla's Leonardo paper, a wonderful paper they stopped making before the internet, sorry to say. It's the size of a postcard, scanned at 1200 DPI. That's so high res you wouldn't want to upsample it. The rabbit's eye on the drawing isn't much bigger than a BB. Let's look at something less defined. Walking ape? Hmm. It was good enough at 600 DPI. Here's a photo, not a scan, of me doing a demo. And yeah, you zoom in on that and it does a pretty good job at keeping a kind of crispness. The campfire explosion. I scan this with a consumer scanner and the enhancing brings out the inconsistency. Some parts really sharp, some with smeary looking artifacts. The bears, yeah. This is nice to upsample better, but I think if I have low res scans that I just as soon put the work into selective processing on my own. Someday artificial intelligence may do it better. In the meantime, natural intelligence with unprocessed scans and selective sharpening tools later. Better way to go, I think. But thank you, Stan, for telling me about it and Charlie for enhancing these. You know what this is also great for? You know how you get, you do a Google search of like some, some painting and it's at like 1200 by like 900. And you're like, ah, it's almost good. Right. Right? Like, I could see what it is, but I wish it was bigger. I know, all the time. Well. <laughs> now we have this. Yeah. Again, you can't take a tiny one and upscale it. Yeah. But if it's like 1200, like, yeah, you could probably upscale that. Have you ever seen what they did with the Night Watch, the Rembrandt painting, where they scan the thing so that you can look almost into the microfibers? <laughs> <laughs> Not that you'd care to, especially with, with Rembrandt's work. He wouldn't care for you to do that. That'd be the kind of thing that Escher or some of my early pencil drawings that uh, you'd want that. It's like, oh gosh, if you get a microscope out, you can see that this artist manipulated the individual molecules. <laughs> right. Okay, let's go to the next question. Hi, Stan and Marshall. Uh, my name's Kelsey. I'm 25 years old and I've been accepted to the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. I'm going into my second year after transferring and throwing into community college. And my question is, how do you get past the fear that you're not as good as your peers when you're in school? Because that is a big fear of mine right now is that I'm an older illustrator in Beijer and there's 18 and 19 year olds that, you know, are leagues ahead of me in terms of being an illustration. And I just want to know or have hear your advice about what to do to get past that. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. I'll start with this one. Okay. Kelsey, the best thing you can do is when you go into that environment, look at the younger people who are doing better than you, who you could see, these are my fiercest competition, and do everything you can to champion them, to celebrate them, to <laughs> bless them, to be a positive part of their lives. Because that's what a healthy immune system does. When you go into a school, you're becoming a part of an immune system, whether you know it or not. Some people don't know that when I go into an environment, I'm a part of an immune system. And the immune system, if it's healthy, knows how to treat the stuff that isn't good and treat the stuff that's good. So when you're around students who do well, the more you can do everything you can to encourage that and empower that with what you have to offer... Uh, and there, are, there can be a hundred ways that you can creatively seek that. But that's the first thing I'd say. If you can change your spirit from one of fearful competition to one of encouraging your potential future teammates, who in a way are your teammates right now, that's, that's a way to do your best with it. Yeah. I, it's funny. I was going to say the same thing, but not nearly as well. 
<laughs> we've been doing a lot of live streams mm -hmm. past several weeks and we've gotten this question a few times like this comes up regularly of people feeling like they need to compete with everybody else like they need to be better and i don't understand that mentality i mean i guess i kind of understand it but i i feel like it's it's not the right mentality you, you don't think about everybody else think about just think about yourself compete with yourself and don't try to take someone else down right because if you if you say I'm afraid that someone's going to be better than me, then really what you're thinking is, I want everyone to be worse than me. That's the hidden thing that happens, yes. Why is it such a bad thing if you're surrounded by people who are better than you? Isn't that the goal? <laughs> yeah. Like when you're learning something, would you rather be surrounded by people who are incompetent and you're, you're the person they look up to? Or would you rather be surrounded by geniuses who will bring you up and, and you could be inspired by and learn from? Yeah. Going into this, if I were you, I would hope to be the worst person there. Good thinking. Good attitude. And then be nice to them and, and yeah, like Marshall said, celebrate them and they will be your friend. Even if you're not the best one there, they'll be your friend because they like you. Yeah. They'll be your network and then you'll get a job because you're a pleasure to be around. <laughs> But the chances are you're not going to be the worst one there, right? So, that's not even like, that's probably not a concern. It's just your fear. That's right. But the fear should not be there because it's, it's coming from the wrong place, I think. This is interesting. The, the question could have been, I'm going into a new environment and I'm 10 times better than everybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, what should I do? How am I going to deal with the people who are that lousy? Yeah. <laughs> Without elaborating with specifics, because they can be harsh, I've observed so many different environments in schools that have been healthy and poisonous. And sometimes you get it where at one school, you've got a poisonous environment, and then two miles uh, down the road, you've got one of the healthiest environments you've been in, and the contrast between them can be startling. And that's one of the first things you look for, is whether people are looking out for each other, and supporting, helping, encouraging, empowering each other, or whether they are trying to undercut each other or upset when somebody else does better than they do. It's just, that's one of the first ways to see how this immune system works. Yeah, when you're there, when you're in school and you are surrounded by people who are better than you, it, it feels bad. It could feel bad because you're like, oh man, how are they doing so good and I'm not. Um, but you got to remember that the school is not the end. The school is a vehicle yeah. to then get you into the real world where you're going to be surrounded by people even better yeah. than the people in your school. And the vehicle you want to be in is the vehicle that's really fast and, and powerful and safe, right? The, whatever, the, the best vehicle. And the good vehicle is the one that will challenge you the most, that will get you ready for that real world where you're going to be challenged even more. Yeah. And so, when you're there and you feel intimidated by all the talent and the skill, or whatever, you, you ha just remember that, that this is good to get you better. <laughs> it's good for you. And there's, there's also an irony that when you are celebrating people because they are better than you, you tend to look at that competence and have positive feelings, which I think means that you start to have positive feelings when you're doing, when you're increasing your own competence. Mm. Rather than looking at people doing well and rehearsing negative feelings so that when you're doing well, you've triggered this, uh, this knee-jerk response of good work. <clears throat> yeah. You may find that one of the best things in the world is to be in that environment where they're all so good. You'll feel good. Yeah. And you'll get better. If you have a healthy relationship with all these people, then you're creating a healthy network of people who will support you in your success yeah. rather than be jealous once you succeed and, and then don't want to be around you because it makes them feel yeah. bad. Hey, there's another thing we can mention in here to make it even more specific. One of the things in a, in a group is that you see that some people are better at some things and other people are better at other things. And so, to look around and see people's strengths and see how the strengths relate to other strengths can be good for the long run also. Because many people going into the field for a career are going to be working on teams. 
And so you see, this person is the best at this thing. Put them in that role if you have any any uh, say in their life. Mm-hmm. Kelsey, we all bring in a spirit to an environment. And so that's where you can sort of look at your the spirit you're bringing in. I'm excited for you. You'll be a good student. Uh, hey, uh, first off, I wanted to say uh, I really appreciate the show. Uh, it means a lot to me. I get a lot of insight from it. I was wanting to become a professional artist at some point, but I live in an area where there's not a lot of opportunity in artistic fields. So I guess I wanted your advice on whether or not if I should move somewhere else or if I should just try to find connections online or if I should just not worry about connections right now and just focus on getting better at art. Um, Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is one of those it depends questions. Always. Always. And so, <laughs> you have, you'll have to compare the options. Okay, so you, you're going to have to do some adult thinking here and compare the benefits of e- each of these options. So, if you do study online and you, there's nothing around you for community, you're going to have to spend a lot of time trying to recreate community, trying to communicate with artists online. You might have to travel a little bit more to, to see artists in person and interact with them. Um, go, to, go to conventions and stuff like that. Um, versus, you know, you might have to move to get the community. But if you're moving to get the community and you're, but you're going to like a really expensive and kind of a crappy school, I would say that's not worth it. Um, to get that so you're gonna have to analyze what what options are you actual what what is actually on your plate can you go to california if you're becoming an animator can you move to california and go to uh cal arts or can you or is that not an option right so it's like can you move to san diego and go to watts atelier can you go to new york and study at Grand Central, if that's, you know, if these are your goals. I don't know even what your goal is, so. Just to be a pro. To be a pro at what? At what? Yeah, yeah, that's right. What? At what? So, can you afford moving to New York to go to whatever school is great for whatever you're trying to do? If you can't afford it, it's not an option. Yeah. And so, you have to, you have to weigh what the actual options are and see, how do I get rid of the 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 cons of that option and yeah do some planning <laughs> or a mixture try going somewhere for six months instead of going all in on uh moving to a different city or three months trying it out i i agree you are you are trying to put this into a priority of what you can do uh all three of the things you mentioned uh, uh answered your own question if you can move, move to an area where you're plugged into the industry's social environment. If you can't move, you can have a career online. It's happening. And then the third thing about should you not worry about it too much, worry about it later. Yeah. Until you're getting your skill, you don't need to worry about it too much. Always keep an eye to it. Don't put your head in the sand and ignore the profession. But, but you also, do have to worry about it a little bit. You do. Always try to build your network. More as you get closer to it. But it's sort of like yeah. middle schoolers whose lives are ruined because all they're <laughs> concerned with is which college they're going to go to and what their career is going to be. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it be really counterproductive that you've got that much stress all through your teen years. Well, as you get closer to what you're going to do, then you get more serious about it. But in the early stages, skill has to come before career. So, sure. Yeah. And also, networking will become much easier as your skills grow. Yeah. When you're just a beginner, all the effort of networking is a hundred times more difficult. It's, it, most of it is a waste of time unless you're finding mentors. That's, that's great. Yeah. If you're networking for being a professional, most of it is a waste of time because most people just ignore you because you're a beginner. So it's you're way more effective trying to network as a skilled person. Yeah, short answer is if you can move, move. And if you can't, mm-hmm. exploit your computer. It potentially connects you with everybody. 
And if you can wait until you feel like you're ready to emerge, uh, wait. But don't put your head in the sand. Keep an eye on what's going on in the industry and gradually focus in on where you're going to be making your living. Yeah. Cool. Good job, Marshall. You did such a good job with that one. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jake, and I'm like an art student right now. I have a two-part question for Marshall. I've been studying like perspective really hardcore for about like a year and a half, and I kind of feel like I've read and watched most of what there is about perspective. Of course, like there's always more, but that's why I wanted to ask: uh, what will be like new in your perspective course and have you learned anything new in the process of making the course? I love your guys' podcast, and I love to hear about the more rare resources that you guys have gathered throughout the years. Thanks, and I hope the kids are doing well, Stan. Kids are doing great. Thanks. This question was for you, Marshall, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do 10 seconds in the beginning, and, and then you can take over. Okay. I have a feeling that if he, if he has uh, absorbed most of what there is to learn about perspective, but he's still trying to learn perspective he's probably not doing nearly as much practice as he should be this question is probably irrelevant for you um because whatever new information marshall has discovered about perspective will not help you <laughs> because you need to go practice <laughs> okay if you've digested all most of what there is to know about perspective you sh and you've practiced it you don't need Marshall's course, but you should take Marshall's course to support Marshall. But Marshall, go ahead. <laughs> what more will there be? The main thing there will be more of, uh, other than good production, uh, does, <laughs> good production because my yeah. 1994 course was just a camera in front of me in a classroom. So yes, this will be a Proco course, but the main thing that I'm offering in it is assignments because that 1994 course didn't have any assignments. It just assumed that you were self-motivated enough to make up your own assignments. So, uh, that's the main thing. Yeah. And it will cover more because we're going to take more time with it. But you also asked me, what have I learned? I've learned a lot. Uh, let me list one of the things I've learned in the last 25 years, 26, 27 years since that first course. One is that the kind Has of perspective. Been, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait, what year is your. 1994. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, in my head, that course was like 15 years old, maybe 10. It's like, it's like 27 years old. Time marches on. Holy crap. That has aged well. It's still the thing that people go to. I brag about it because the thing it has to offer for all of its flaws is the train of thought. But this is not about that course. This is about what I've learned since. One of the main things I've learned is that what most artists study for perspective is only one of a number of systems that were developed for architects and industrial designers and engineers. Uh, books, here are a couple of books that have been in multiple uh, iterations, like from the 1940s and 50s of technical drawing and mechanical drawing, uh -huh. and the amount of material in here for uh, the stuff that you need to know if you are going to go into drafting as a, or engineering as a drawer is huge. But the system that we use that most artists use is not that concerned with all of that other stuff. So, part of my challenge is how much to explain that stuff, how much to include it, and how much of it will just waste your time because it will take you into a deep engineering path that is not necessarily going to make you a better artist. So, there's one thing, yeah. is that perspective is more complicated than most, or more complex a world then most artists are aware of it. Yeah, I feel like, okay, Marshall's perspective course, the difference will probably be mostly in the delivery and in the structure of the course. Yeah. It's going to be fun. It's going to be 
explained clearly. Yeah. I mean, Marshall has revised each script like 17 times to be as yeah. as precise and perfect as possible. I mean, you've even at a point we're trying to be poetic with your words. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> but the, the, the amount of energy he's put into every word of, of that, that course is just unbelievable. And so, it's the delivery that'll be worth it for beginners, I think. For beginners, that's right. And intermediate people who want those assignments. I think I said that they don't need your course. If, if you, like what you said just now though, is like, if you are having a hard time actually getting out and practicing the stuff that you're reading about, mm -hmm. the, this course will probably be good. We'll get to that in a minute. There's another thing that I've learned, and that is that how many perspective books and perspective teaching comes from the previous uh, generations uh, or the, the, the latest one. In other words, we, we learn perspective by studying perspective uh, and we can trace it back. And it's great when people are coming out with new perspective courses that they're reiterating the old stuff if what they do is make it easier on your brain. Yeah. You look at some of the old perspective books. This one, uh, Rex Vickett Coles, is a sort of famous one from the early 20th century. And I went through the whole thing and I liked the book. I learned from it. But I would never recommend this book to you because it's got some of that quality of the older books uh, uh, where the, the teachers had an attitude like training alchemists. Yeah. Make it hard on them so that they, you, you weed out the ones that are flippant about it. And I'm on the opposite extreme of that. It's like, how can you do this in the fewest words, that's the hardest thing about it. How can you do this so that you don't introduce that concept until the other concept has been introduced? That's one of the reasons why when I'm done with this, I want to say I'm done with it, is that it, you can't trip on the train of thought. So there's another thing that I've learned, is that the hardest thing about teaching perspective is not teaching perspective. Yeah. It is about simplifying the experience of the student to where something that complex does not get confusing. And the people who are using perspective the most effectively in their day-to-day -day drawing and their professional drawing are often people who don't know every in and out. They have assimilated the thing. Go back to the episode that we did in the first, was it the first season about perspective? I think it was. Yeah, I think it was the first season. It was towards the end. Go back to that Draftsman podcast where we spent a session on perspective. And I'll just reiterate what I said back then. The main thing I've learned about perspective is that the most important thing is to simply master the three axes. Because any movement in that imaginary space on your flat surface is moving either up and down, left and right, or front and back, or a combination of those. And so the great challenge is can I, in my freehand drawing, have a vision of where to put the lines? That's the big point that Ernest Watson made at the opening of the book I like so much of Create a Perspective. So the master artists of perspective don't even think about perspective anymore. They just see it. But they have trained themselves to get to that point by really understanding those cubes. I'm so excited about your course, man. I can't wait till it's actually done. Uh, you know, I've apologized many times yeah, yeah, and many yeah, times I've ref ref refused to apologize. But I'm starting to get excited about it myself because it's what I'm putting my energy into next. And you just even reading over the free scripts, this is going to be the kind of thing we're going to put it on YouTube. So the bulk of it, the bulk of the, the information that you need is on YouTube. And then the premium will be the real slow motion step by step stuff. But and the, the, thing that I'm, the thing I'm proud about so far is how few words I got it down to, unlike the Draftsman podcast. <laughs> well, it's, un it's unplanned. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. Some when people like this though. You see, I know. It, it, the, when you simplify it to as few words as possible, that's made for re-watching, right? That's right. made for absorbing, pausing, thinking. Yeah. Playing, pausing, thinking, replaying. Yeah. It's for studying. So you don't waste time listening to an hour trying to take out those three really important pieces in it yeah. that could have been said in five minutes. It's the video is five minutes 
and you could rewatch it three times and really get that information. Yeah. So, that's good for studying, but the podcast is good for people who are driving and all that. It's great. It's that's got right. its value. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, the, the, uh, the unplanned atmosphere. Now, Jake, if you know perspective from having gone to all of these resources, you've got the knowledge. I'm interested in the skills. I'm interested in seeing where it goes with your drawing. And if you've got the skills, great. Your curiosity to know more about perspective is, it might pay you off as a teacher. It might pay you off. It's just that you love the subject. But if it's, if it's going to be made practical, that's what are you doing with it? How are you applying it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That we, I forgot to, to mention that. Like, J Jake, if you have digested almost everything there is to know about perspective information, then there's two steps, two things you need to do next. One is practice it so that you can execute it and not think about it. And the second one is teach people. Yeah. Because teaching people will make you understand it even better and it'll just get you yeah. to a different level of your skill. The impetus for it all though is the love of certain kinds of imagery. Seeing Escher's images when I was 19 years old, later seeing McKay and, and others that use perspective so well, I just felt like I don't, I'm not interested in perspective. I'm interested in maybe someday when I'm a grown-up, I'll be able to draw like that. There is, I think, the best motive for it. The third thing that I want you to do, Jake, and this is related to the first one. <laughs> uh, it's related to practice, but it's start using this information in real projects. Don't just do assignments and try to like, you know, draw boxes and flip them and stuff. Like actually... Like go out and and draw your house, whatever or whatever you're excited about. You know, don't do that because I just said it. But but figure out something you actually want to do that requires an understanding of perspective, and now start applying it to a real project because that'll help. Um, and the fourth the fourth thing, Jake, that I want you to do right now is to go to Proco.com <laughs> and participate in the community and post your stuff so you can get critiqued and then help other people who are struggling with perspective because you know. You know what is wrong with their stuff because you've digested all that information. Good thinking. Stan, <laughs> if it would do any good. And the uh, fifth thing, go give us those likes and hearts and TikToks because we're at the end of the episode. What did you <laughs> oh, that's right. I didn't know we were that deeply into this. <laughs> yeah. Would it be any good to uh, post the assignments that we're planning on putting? I've already made them public anyway what, from what those workshops I've done to post some of the perspective assignments. Uh, so that people already know what the assignments are going to be from the course. Yeah. No. No. Don't do that yet. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> what, we should do it with when the with the course. All right. I, I won't. <laughs> wait, wait. Did you already post them somewhere? No. No. I won't. Oh. Okay. No. But <laughs> one of the things one of the things that people should do is that they should draw a floor plan of their room and then try sketching it from different points of view. Ah, uh, you can't help yourself, can you? <laughs> but that's an assignment. That's early in the course. That's an assignment. That, but you, that's one that you just mentioned, yeah. Well, I was talking about drawing your house from outdoor, outside. You look at your house and you draw your house in perspective. Oh, okay, yeah. That's something I did. I, I went to Bubba Park and I did all the buildings and all that. that. That's fun. That's a cool way to actually use perspective to draw something real. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Marshall. I, that's all the voicemails we got. I'm having such a good time, I don't want to stop. I know, I don't either, but I got to go eat. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, you go eat. Okay. Bye, guys. Okay. Thanks for being with us.